WGBH News and the Boston Globe present a live gubernatorial debate, one-on-one with Charlie Baker and Martha Coakley. From the WGBH studios in Brighton, here are moderators Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. Good evening. It's two weeks until Election Day, and we hope the next 60 minutes will help you decide your vote for governor. We intend to cover a lot of ground, and the only thing we can tell you about the format is that there isn't one. It's just a conversation with the two leading candidates for governor. And please feel free to talk to each other as often as you like. We'll also be going to some questions from our partners at the Boston Globe. They're already talking to each other. So, Charlie, Martha, we really appreciate your joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, Marjorie, shall we? So you're both running as job creator in chief, and you both have plans explaining how you're going to do that. But Martha, first, you, you've been working in the public sector for 28 years, uh, obviously not creating private sector jobs there. So how do you convince people that you can do this for them in the private sector? Well, first of all, what's been really important in my experience is seeing what barriers are to job creation in the private sector, how over-regulation or energy costs, health care costs are barriers to that. I've seen that as attorney general. And I also understand what the state has been able to do, like the governor has with investments in life sciences, to spur job creation, to work as a good partner with schools, uh, and to provide for the growth in the economy that we see happening already. And I think one of the differences, I think, between the two of us is I see the need to keep those jobs going, but also the real need to invest in our workforce so that our kids and people will have the jobs and the job skills to keep them here. So, Charlie, what do you think of that plan? Well, I think the big issue we do face is jobs. I mean, it's the number one issue for people everywhere we go. And as I've traveled around the Commonwealth, um, it's very clear to me that some parts of Massachusetts are doing really well and other parts aren't. And a big part of our economic development plan is focused on those regions and those communities that have not done as well as others. And that's why we've been talking about building economies based on the jobs that are already in certain parts of Massachusetts. And it's why, for example, my first campaign event was at UMass Lowell at the Emerging Technology Center, because that is a great public-private partnership between the plastics and polymer manufacturing industry up in the Merrimack Valley and UMass Lowell. And it's created this really terrific virtuous circle between a higher ed institution that provides research and product development expertise to a bunch of firms that want to be here and want to grow here. And it's a great pathway for kids who go through that school into those companies when they graduate. And we should do more of those, build on what we have region by region. Well, and sure, and that's why I have a regional economic development plan that does precisely that in 13 regions, aligning what's happening in our schools already with curriculum, with making sure that as we roll out half a billion dollars over the next 10 years, we will build an economy from the ground up, one that's sustainable, one that invests in our kids and our workforce so that we won't have jobs going begging as we do now, and we won't have people unemployed as we do now. Charlie, when you rescued Harvard Pilgrim, you also outsourced jobs to India, and you shut down an operation in Rhode Island that cost about 1,200 jobs. So the same question I asked to Martha, I asked to you, why should people have confidence that you can create uh, the jobs you claim you can in, in, in the private sector, public sector? Well, Harvard Pilgrim, as most people know, was in terrible shape when I got there. And, uh, and I'm proud of the fact that we managed to rescue not only the jobs associated with Harvard Pilgrim, but the jobs associated with many other healthcare organizations that would have failed if Harvard Pilgrim had gone down as well. And by the way, when we signed that contract with Perot, we outsourced those jobs to Wellesley and to Quincy. And that's where the vast majority of the people who'd been working uh, continued to be employed. And I'm proud of the fact that we saved their jobs along with the thousands of jobs at Harvard Vanguard, which is one of the premier healthcare provider institutions in eastern Massachusetts and save the jobs of thousands of hospitals that may have failed if Harvard Pilgrim had gone down as well. I mean, in some respects, yeah, we had to make some tough decisions. But leadership requires you to make tough decisions. And I said many times that the hardest decision I had to make was to exit the Rhode Island marketplace. But even there, I'm proud of the fact that everybody we owed money to got paid. Everybody who was in active treatment, we continued to serve and make sure they got transitioned properly and that everybody who was employed by us who lost their job, we provided job training and technical assistance and job placement too, and the vast majority of those people ended up getting hired by somebody else. You know, before you respond, just one quick thing about the outsourcing. I get you know, your explanation that you needed to do that to save Harvard Pilgrim. What I don't get, though, is, is the picture I saw you, Charlie, when you got dressed up in a tuxedo and you went to get an award, an outsourcing excellence award, like there was something to celebrate about outsourcing jobs out of the country. What were you thinking? Why did you do that? Well, first of all, the outsourcing award was for the partnership we had with Perot. And remember, 
those jobs stayed here in Massachusetts. And it was a big part of the success we had in taking an organization that was fundamentally broken, in many ways, a lot like many parts of state government are today, and turning it around and making it work for everyone, making it work for the members of Harvard Pilgrim, making it work for the providers that did business with Harvard Pilgrim, making it work for the employees of both Harvard Pilgrim and Perot. Look, we, we saved thousands of jobs and kept them right here in Massachusetts as a result of saving that company. And we also saved the jobs of many other organizations that would have failed if we'd gone under. But can I, Mar uh, Marjorie's questions were about uh, any history of job creation in either of your resumes. And should I assume from your answer and yours that you don't have any, that you preserve jobs by what you did there. You were primarily a public sector person for the last three decades. So in terms of actual job creation, the experience is limited in well, both cases. Is that a fair yeah, statement? No, that's I, that's I not disagree. the only thing I've done for work, OK? I, I mean, I also spent eight years working in the Weldon Salucci administration during which time between tax cuts, workers' comp reform, um, and a host of other reforms, we took a state that had the highest unemployment rate when we took office in 1991 to the lowest unemployment rate in the country by the time Paul Salucci left 10 years later, and we created 500,000 net new jobs in Massachusetts over that period, something I'm very proud of. Briefly, why do you disagree, Martha Well, Coakley? because the, the public sector doesn't necessarily create jobs, but the public sector plays a big role in how jobs are created now they're filled. Give, but I'll give you one example. Please. Company in Fitchburg that had very expensive energy rates, they wanted to do on-site uh, outsourcing of uh, uh, energy production. We helped them cut red tape so they could put up a wind turbine. And because of that, helping them do that, they saved money. They hired 300, 400 more people in that, in that Simons factory. One last quick job thing before we move on. As he prepares to leave office, the Globe has reported Governor Patrick is shifting 500 employees from managerial positions to a public employee union, in essence, tying the hands of the next governor, particularly if it's a person of the other party, and insulating them from removal. Either of you have a problem with what the governor did in the waning days of his administration? Martha, starting with you? First of all, I wasn't involved in that negotiation. No, I understand that. Do you yeah, have a problem and with I, that? I don't know. I think the governor needs to be more transparent about what actually went happened. And until we have that what and why, uh, I think he needs to explain that. Your uh, uh, guy you worked for did some of the same thing to a lesser degree, Bill Weld. Are you troubled by what Deval Patrick did? Yeah, I am. 500 people out of a management workforce that's roughly 3,000 people. You're talking about almost one-sixth of the managers in state government. The fact that it happened two weeks before an election and two months before the end of an administration. And so far, there's no publicly available explanation about what agencies are affected or how they're affected. I, I mean, I worry a know, lot about... We what need this, to know those facts. Well, but I also worry a lot about the message this sends. I mean, one of the things that makes people crazy about government, especially state government, is that there's two sets of rules, one for the people who are on the inside and one for all the people who pay the bills. Look at something like the probation scandal, where day after day we had to listen to testimony that indicated that a whole bunch of people got jobs not because of what they knew, but because of who they knew. And to this day, I'm still the only candidate for governor who actually put out a proposal to make transparent the process through which Massachusetts state government hires people and creating a process to make sure that the public understands who gets the jobs and why. And I think that's a big difference, frankly, between me and the, and the Attorney uh, General. Very briefly. But so, let, so let's just go back about transparency, about big dig financing, putting the financing, kicking that can down the road, being transparent about letting go 700 Department of Mental Health workers, outsourcing that as mental health. So I'm happy to stand on my record. I didn't have anything to do with that particular decision, but let's be transparent about our own records and the decisions we've made and the values that drive those decisions. That's what's at stake in this race. Let's move on to taxes again. Charlie, you said you won't raise taxes unless they're offset by lowering taxes somewhere else. Is that correct? Yep. And if you Martha, want to simplify the code, I'm all for it. Martha says you will only consider taxes as the last resort to protect services that you deem critical. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's fair as far okay. as it goes. Charlie, let me start with you for a minute. Why would a good manager like you take anything off the table before in uh, uh, taking office? You didn't take revenues off the yep. table at Harvard Pilgrim. In fact, you used them. You raised premiums pretty dramatically, which helped you achieve your goal. Why do you take a solution, even if it's not your favorite yeah. one, off the table before you even take office? We, raised it. we also grew our membership by 40% while I was there and took a company that was bankrupt and made it the number one carrier in the country for member satisfaction and customer service for seven years in a row. I mean, we made a ton of operating improvements as well, the kinds of things that I think state government uh, could use a good solid dose of right now. But one of your tools was 150%. Look, I think, I think it's important to send a message to... Uh, to employers, small businesses, everybody in Massachusetts, many of whom feel they've been nickel and dime to death over the course of the past few years, that we're not going to just raise taxes 
to figure out how to pay the bills. Somewhere we have to draw the line. Think about energy costs. Next month, families and businesses in Massachusetts are going to be dealing with a 40% increase in their energy costs because the Commonwealth of Mass, Governor, DPU, and frankly the Attorney General, who's supposed to be the ratepayer advocate, didn't do the work that they should have done to deal with the fact that we knew we were taking three coal-fired plants out of production, which is fine, but therefore we needed to build additional capacity to deal with that, and what we should have been doing as a Commonwealth is moving forward to simply expand existing natural gas pipelines from three feet to four feet, which is a pretty simple process, so that people wouldn't get hit with those increases. Martha, that's the kind yeah. of thing that so, about so first of all, that's a market issue, not a taxpayer issue, about the availability of natural it's gas. It's a cost question, uh, which yeah, affects but that, our but ability you're, to But you're talking jobs. about taxes, and that was that. But So let me just respond to that. Because back in 2010, and now you're for it, but that back in 2010, you were against Cape Wind. In the last four years, when you have not been on the scene, I, as the ratepayer advocate over the last eight years, have brought back $700 million on behalf of consumers standing up to UNIDL, to National Grid, to making sure that none of those costs were passed along. We have come much farther in, along in clean and energy uh, technologies than we would have thought four years ago. So we need to catch up. I agree with that. But you can't take this one season and say that either I or the governor haven't done our job in moving towards energy efficiency, which we've done enormous amount of, and clean technology. Before that we're leading the country. Before I get to you on taxes, does your no new tax thing include no new fees, Charlie Baker, or the yes or no question? I guess it depends upon which fee you're talking about and what it's associated with. Okay. Uh, but Mark, I, I got to say, the governor, uh, excuse quickly, me, the attorney please. general has over a billion dollars of new spending of one type or another that she's already proposed. She's going to have to figure untrue. out how to pay for it. Well, let, let me add a little sp sp Well, a number of people are saying if you total up the numbers, ultimately you do have to raise revenue. Here's your quote, Martha Coakley. If I had to raise revenues, I'd look to revenue options that do not increase the burden on the middle class and those least able to afford it. Give us a couple examples of, not small change examples, serious examples of ways you could do that without increasing the burden on the middle class and well, those least able to afford it. But look, both my opponent and I, and Charlie has refused to take a no new taxes pledge. So let's be honest about what we're both talking about. I've been straightforward in saying, I think in order to move forward, we need to invest in this state. We need to invest in businesses. We need to invest in our kids. We need to invest in our workforce development because otherwise you're missing that equation. What Charlie has proposed is at least 300 million of tax cuts, maybe 600 million according to the Boston Globe. So he says, well, I'll find that money somewhere, but that's okay. He'll find that money somewhere. He also talks about all the kinds of things that he wants to do now, including workforce development. So where does that money come from? I at least am saying I know what my priorities are. Investing in kids, investing in schools, investing in roads and bridges. It's why I support the indexing of the gas tax. So if you had to raise taxes, uh, quoting you to yourself, what would those revenues be that wouldn't increase the burden on the middle class and low income uh, uh, residents? They would be taxes on people who are at the top two or how do you percent. do that? How do you do that? There's no graduated income tax in Massachusetts. Well, we, don't, we are exploring ways to do a more graduated income tax. I know this, this legislature's just done a study on that. Quickly, please. Every four years, someone says they're not going to raise taxes on the middle class. All right? And we've been hearing that for seven years with one party rule on Beacon Hill. Gas tax, middle class. Sales tax, middle class. Satellite TV, middle class. Registry fees, middle class. Most of these tax increases property taxes, fees for after-school sports, all this stuff lands on the middle class. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I've said I'm not going to raise taxes, because I think the middle class feels strapped already. And the last thing they need is another four years of getting nickel and dimed again. Very quickly, very quickly in this weekend. Martha, you oppose the repeal of the gas tax index in question one. Charlie, you support it, saying basically if legislators want to raise taxes, they should vote to do it. Well, once Beacon Hill passes a corporate tax break, and there are hundreds of millions of them, they never review whether they're doing what they were supposed to do, including creating jobs. So in the spirit of question one and your position, would you uh, endorse a position that all corporate tax breaks should expire unless there, there is a vote of the legislature to extend them and renew them? I think what we ought to do is an annual review of whether or not we're getting what we think we're supposed to get out of them. I think that's absolutely worth doing, and I would do that as governor. That would you do that, uh, Martha Coakley? I, I have always said that we should be looking at whether tax breaks we give to businesses uh, bring the money back and have clawback positions if they don't. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, let's talk a bit, little bit about immigration. Um, Charlie, where are you on driver's licenses for uh, immigrants who are here legally? 
Um, I don't support uh, driver's licenses for people who are undocumented. And the main reason for that uh, is no one's ever been able to explain to me how you can actually document and verify someone who is undocumented. And I think there are real issues. And I get the fact that for many people this is a, this is a burden and an inconvenience, and I understand that, and I've talked to a lot of them about mm -hmm. it. But fundamentally, we need Washington to deal with this question and to solve this immigration problem so that we, can, we at the state and local level can figure out how to deal with it. One of the things I've said I would do as governor is try to create a coalition of governors to make the case, probably in conjunction with mayors and other local officials, to Washington that we at the local level and the people who live at the local level deal with the hard reality of our broken immigration system. The folks in Washington, for the most part, treat immigration like a football. And I think for both sides, in many cases, it works not to fix it. And that's a problem. And we need to create a coalition, bipartisan, and get after them on this one. Where are you on Martha, where are you? Well, I, I wish they treated it like a football. They're, they're not doing anything about it. They're not even handling it. And so I know other states have reached solutions on that, Charlie. And I've said I would look at it, particularly as now we have to move to a new system of real ID. There are going to be people in Massachusetts who aren't going to be able to get those because they don't have their birth certificates. There's a lot of people inconvenienced. And I think this is an appropriate time. And I've said this during this campaign. There are a lot of people who have been here for a long time. They can't get to work. They can't get to a, a medical emergency if they don't have licenses. I've talked to police chiefs. I don't know exactly how we do it. There's some pending legislation. But we have to address this issue for people in Massachusetts who are in our communities and make sure that we address really, it as a public safety issue. Really quickly, in-state tuition for people who are here illegally, are you for it or against it? I support the governor's um, executive order. I don't support going beyond that because, in my opinion, if you're going to get an in-state tuition subsidized by the taxpayer, you need to be able to work here in Massachusetts when you graduate. Okay, so that's a no. It's a yes for the governor's executive order. It's a no for going beyond What's that. What's the governor's executive order? The governor's executive order basically says that if you fall into certain categories where you can, in fact, work here after you graduate, then you are eligible for in-state tuition. I'm okay. okay with that. I support that. How about but you, But I'm Martha? not in favor of going beyond that and basically saying people who can't work here in Massachusetts upon graduation should be able to access a taxpayer-funded education. And how about you, well, Martha? I support what the governor has done also, but I support looking at extending that. I think that for kids who have come here through no reasoning of their own, I met a young woman just yesterday who said, you know, I want an education. I came at four years from Chile, and I need to have to get a job. We should be encouraging people who are law-abiding, who want to work, the opportunity to do that. Okay, let's bring in the Boston Globe's uh, reporter, Maria Sacchetti, please. I cover immigration. Half a million people in Massachusetts are not citizens. They're unable to vote, run for public office, or serve on juries. In East Boston, half the adults could not vote in the casino referendum because they weren't citizens. Is this an issue for you? And if elected governor, what would you do about it? Charlie? Charlie? I think you need to be a citizen to vote. And it's always been that way, and that's the way I support it. And I come back to what I said at the beginning of this conversation. We need governors and local officials for whom the issues associated with the federal government's inability, unwillingness, whatever it is, to deal with the immigration issue, to form, a, to form a coalition and make the case and make these guys and gals uncomfortable. I mean, it makes me nuts that every day I run into people in circumstances and situations that are compounded by the fact that the federal government has not been willing to address this question. But Charlie, with all due respect, the, 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 the Congress is not even meeting and we're in the middle of a war. So the reality is, in the reasonable t uh, time frame, they're not going to do that. So it sort of falls back on states, governors, like you both want to be, to decide in the absence of leadership from Congress, what do you do? And so what do you do? Ha there are 500,000 million, 500, people in the state who are not citizens. Two-thirds of them are here legally, legal permanent residents. Uh, a huge number of them in East Boston, for example, as Maria said, were affected by this thing, and they don't get the vote. Your view is, even on a local thing, can't do it. Correct? No, I would not support that. How about you, Martha Coker? I think that certain cities and towns have looked at giving the local option. I think that there should be some requirements ahead of time. But I do believe, and I've seen particular over the past year, whether you're in uh, Framingham with the Brazilian poor population, you're in Chelsea, you're in Revere, uh, we have a new Massachusetts. We have a lot of new residents who are here. They're going to be here. I know Washington isn't going to move. I'm always not afraid to sue Washington when they're not doing what they should. So, but can you see a, a, a non-citizen who is a legal resident, legally here, can you imagine allowing them to vote in a local election? With local I think impact? that's up to the local authorities, but I certainly wouldn't oppose it. Okay, can we move on here? 
Sure. Um, Charlie, you lost to Deval Patrick by 24 points among women last time around when you ran for governor. Thank you so much for <laughs> You're welcome. Me, Marjorie. I really well, I'm appreciate gonna, that. I'm going to remind you a few more Ouch. things, yeah. <laughs> Charlie. Okay. You, know, you, you, you got in a little <clears throat> hot water calling a reporter sweetheart earlier in the campaign, and then you said the, uh, at first anyway, yeah, you're the, killing me. <laughs> <laughs> the Hobby Lobby decision, which allows certain corporations uh, not to cover contraception. I think your words were, it does not matter in Massachusetts. And you did apologize for both of those. Martha Coakley's supporters uh, uh, made a lot of hay yep. about this. Do you think uh, Martha Coakley and her supporters and the media treated you fairly about those two issues or not? Well, I'm, um, on the Hobby Lobby issue, I basically am guilty of wildly overthinking it. But I am pleased to say that I'm still the only candidate in the race who proposed a solution to that problem for women in Massachusetts. By, increase, by proposing to increase funding, which I would do as governor in the family health line item at the Department of Public Health to make it possible for women here in Massachusetts, if they work for a company that falls between the cracks associated with the state law and the federal law, to be able to access the contraceptives that aren't covered under that decision. And I'm proud of that um, recommendation, and I will always support women's access uh, to full benefits and uh, contraceptive services. I said when I got into this race, I was going to chase 100% of yeah. the vote. And I'm pretty pleased with the response we've gotten from people across the Commonwealth, from every neighborhood, uh, men and women, to our agenda about how we create more jobs and improve our schools and, and build great communities and bring balance and, and bipartisanship to Beacon Hill. And, uh, and I've, been, I've been really pleased by the response we've gotten from everybody. Do you think Martha's supporters were unfair? It's a campaign, Marjorie. Okay. I mean, I fully expect that if I say something dumb, Marjorie's... Uh, uh, <laughs> Excuse me, Martha. Okay. Martha's okay. people. Just don't are gonna, call me sweetheart. Yeah, don't worry. Martha, Martha's, Martha's people are going to let me have it. Okay? Oh, okay, that's the way it okay. works. And I would expect and anticipate well, let, that you know, kind of works the other way. Let too. me ask you something, Martha Coakley. You've known Charlie Baker for a long time. Is there anything in his record or in what he's done that would lead you to believe that he treats women as second-class citizens and no, has been demeaned? No, I'm not. I'm not, and we're not accusing him of of being sexist. I he's uh, done great work. He's done a good job in the Cassie's taken on. I think the real issue for me, and I think for voters, is who do you see, who do you work with, who are you going to champion when you move forward? And look, I, you know, the first response for me in the Hobby Lobby decision was, oh no, because it's not just about contraception, it's about other forms of discrimination. And I've been very much involved in these issues because they're personal to me. They're personal to young girls and women, getting equal, equal pay, making sure they have access to health care. These aren't, you know, academic issues that I overthink. These are things that I know are real issues for people in the Commonwealth, particularly Be women. Before we move ahead, just apropos of this, Charlie, starting with you briefly and then Martha Coakley, what's the one mis misconception of you in this campaign when you go home at night and speak to your spouse drives you absolutely up the wall? What is it, Charlie? <laughs> that I care about numbers and I don't care about people. That's the single biggest thing that drives me up the wall. How about you? My entire professional career has been about people. I didn't run for the Board of Selectmen in Swampscott and stand out in the rain because I cared about the numbers. I did it because I wanted to help the people in my town. I didn't spend eight years working in the Weldon Salucci administration because it was about the numbers. I did it because I wanted to help people. And I took the job at Harvard Pilgrim because thousands of people were going to lose their jobs and millions of people were going to lose their health care coverage if we didn't figure out how to fix it. For me, it's always been about people. And it bothers me that a guy who is pretty facile with math, which does matter when you're talking about a $38 billion budget, is somehow considered to be somebody who doesn't care about people. Well, so that's Martha. also what this debate is about, and that's what this race is about. And so I'll put my record up against yours. I'm not criticizing what you did. I just think it shows that when you are taking over Harvard Pilgrim, you do increase premiums, you do outsource mental health, and your salary goes up. I wouldn't make those choices, Charlie. And I have, in my lifetime as a prosecutor and as an attorney general, always made the decision to stand for people not to lose their jobs. There were 200 jobs outsourced to India at a time when Harvard Pilgrim had already been turned around. There were 700 DMH employees who lost their job and people left without mental health care because of your decisions. We can debate about whether you're a good guy or not. I don't dispute that. It's about the values that drive your choices. And I so think let's, voters let's are talk certainly... About mental, let's talk about the mental health issue for a minute. Absolutely. Um, I'm proud of the work that we did in the 1990s 
creating and building a community-based healthcare delivery system for people who no longer belonged in institutions. Those places were not great places to take care of anyone. And many folks in the advocacy community supported much of what we chose to do during that period of time. And by the way, as we sit here 20 years later, have we solved all the problems in mental health? Absolutely not. But a good piece of the work that we did and the structure we put in place and the solutions that we found for people are exactly the way the system works today. Well, no, but let's Quickly, take one please. piece of that. It's in the, it's in the globe today that we, we wanted, uh, let's assume we wanted to take people out of those institutions. But the missing piece was providing the supports and the care for them once they were out. 700 workers lost their jobs. Only 60% of that amount then went for outpatient services. And Charlie, I'm working in the district attorney's office at the same time. I see the uptick that people are homeless, people who have mental health problems, who end up in the criminal justice system because we didn't take care of them. Ten seconds. Is there a misconception about you that upsets you, Martha Coakley, quickly? Yeah, um, I think that, that people still think, you know, from 2010 that I, I don't have a sense of humor or I'm too chilly, and I've, I've worked for four years to overcome that. But uh, Fair enough. Let, can we hear from Mark Arsenal? He's a reporter for uh, the uh, Boston Globe. Listen. I've been covering casino issues here at the Globe for three years. If the state casino law survives a repeal challenge on the day that one of you is elected, then as many as two resort casinos and a slot parlor are likely to open during your first term, making you the first to govern Massachusetts as a casino state. How much casino gambling have you done personally in your life, and how does that experience, or the lack of it, inform your policies on gambling? I have a guess, but let's start with you, Charlie yeah. Baker, and then you, Martha Coakley. I've played a little blackjack um, and never done well, okay? I mean, the one time I actually made money, I sent texts to a whole bunch of my friends and said I was going to quit my day job and become a full-time <laughs> professional gambler, and then I gave it all back the next day. And I have absolutely no idea how craps works, although I have watched it a lot. How does how it inform you? your position on casinos? Um, I think the, I, I said all along that I'm a big fan of one casino. Actually, my preferred option would have been for Massachusetts to just have the state of Connecticut send us $400 million every year not to build a casino, which I think would have been the best outcome of all. But there are a lot of people from Massachusetts who enjoy uh, the atmosphere, the hospitality, the restaurants, and all the rest. And, uh, and so I've said for a long time that I always thought one casino in Massachusetts made sense. How about you, Martha? So I'm, like gambling? Not, I'm not a gambler. Really? I, Never uh, been down to I haven't Connecticut? been down to Foxwoods. I know you have because you I talked have. about That's it. Right. It's a wild but, time. But let me tell you what I have. <laughs> it's a wild time. So let me tell you. You'll be, look, you'll be looking for those to open now, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, what I have done is because when this first appeared as a proposal in Massachusetts, I knew that we weren't ready for it. We didn't have a money laundering statute. I know from working with the Attorney General in New Jersey and uh, Nevada, uh, the kind of oversight and regulatory work you have to do around everything from money laundering to organized crime infiltration to human trafficking. And so one of the things I did do as Attorney General what, and with folks in our office was work really closely in crafting this statute, looking at what we had to do here in Massachusetts if we were going to maximize the economic benefit and minimize the social ills. You Let's know, step back up again. I'm sorry, Margaret. I was just going to say, both of you have said that you would, um, you, if we get rid of the casino law in Massachusetts, that you would like a Springfield casino. Isn't that kind of thwarting, well it is, thwarting the will of the voters? I'll start with you, Charlie. If the voters, if the voters turn down the three, the three casinos and the slot parlor, you know, good for the voters. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, and I'm glad that this question is on the ballot. Unlike the attorney general, I thought it should have been on the ballot from the beginning. And when you collect 125,000 signatures, you belong on the ballot. Um, but I've walked the site in Springfield. I'm pretty sure I'm the only candidate who has. And that's a really interesting proposal in a part of Springfield that was hit by the tornado that is basically dying right right before our eyes and um, it's a 600 million dollar investment and it's a very innovative model in the sense that the casino they don't wrap the whole thing up into the project it's a casino and then they basically build a streetscape they basically rebuild a part of downtown Springfield with the hospitality restaurant and retail piece and they connect it to the Civic Center so that the MGM becomes the global player that can actually bring entertainment venues and entertainment acts to the, so you don't the think you're thwarting the will of the voters? Well, no. I mean, I think bringing it up and having a conversation about it 
is worthwhile. But the vote, you know, at that point, the legislature and others may choose to say no. Very quickly. How about you? So quickly. We'll know in two weeks. And I have said, if it is repealed, I would consider as part of a regional economic development plan for Springfield that kind of uh, leveraging of an economic uh, with a casino that could provide growth for other industries. Okay, we're halfway through, so we're going to try to pick up the pace to drop. But just staying on the whole gambling thing, more is bet and lost on the lottery in the state per capita than any state in America by far. We add three casinos and a slots parlor if your vote is successful and we don't repeal. Are either of you troubled by the fact that we have this increasing huge reliance on low and moderate income people losing money to help fund state and local services that you both embrace? Martha, quickly, and then sure. Charlie Sure. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm against Internet gaming. It's one of the reasons why we have brought very strict consumer protections to make sure there's no lending of money on casino premises, to make sure you can't be foreclosed upon if you somehow you know, get into debt because of casinos. Mm -hmm. So there are consumer protections we've worked on. I'd continue to do that as governor if we do move forward here. You worry about it, Charlie? Baker? Yeah, a lot. Um, in fact, one of the reasons I supported one casino is I, I believe that, I can't imagine that three casinos and a slot parlor isn't going to have a huge impact on the lottery, which, as we all know, is a big supporter for the Commonwealth cities and towns. Let me ask you And that. by the way, it's also going to... Three casinos and a slot parlor will absolutely have an impact on the other industries, hospitality, restaurant, retail, that compete for that entertainment and discretionary dollar that people spend. Part of what made the Springfield project interesting to me was you're talking about making a big investment in a place where currently there's not a lot going on, and that's what makes it attractive. Let me ask you something about judges. Uh, Jag Remy was arrested at least 19 times for beating up four different girlfriends, and one judge after another let him out with little or no jail time. Uh, after he murdered uh, Jennifer Martell, a lot of us believe that judges around here will be getting tougher about repeat violent uh, batterers. And yet we just learned that a Lynn judge allowed yet another repeat batterer to get off with no jail time, even after he dragged his girlfriend with his car. Um, so what, Martha Coakley, should happen to these judges? Should they just be able to serve until they retire, or should there be some something here? Well, first of all, we have made changes. Speaker DeLeo took the lead, and I worked with them to make sure on bail hearings there's more information before people are released on bail. And frankly, judges should at least be reviewed on some of the decisions they make. There's an internal process that happens now. They have not made that public. And look, Marjorie, you and I have talked about this for years. You can always take one case and say, well, this was the wrong decision. That's obviously not the right result in that case. I think the prosecutor but this just has happened, to... But this just happened again in, in Lynn, you know, post all the talk about Jared, Jared Remy and, and tightening things up. No, I understand, and it doesn't sound like it's a bail situation so much. That was the instance there where he got out on bail before he was convicted. This is leniency in sentencing. We have sentence guidelines. We have an ability, not for the prosecutor, but to vent stories to appeal it. Getting that balance with judges is tough, but it's something that I care deeply about, and I think it so, should be part of the process so when, when judges review, are confirmed. What do you mean, though? Do we review them five years down the road, ten years down the road? Do we ask them to explain themselves and when they make these them? weird? Well, right now it's an internal review that's done by the courts with the input of litigants uh, and lawyers who have appeared before those judges. They have not made that public, but I believe... Should they Well, uh, perhaps in cases like this where the results appear to be not consistent with public safety and defendant's rights. What do you think should happen to these judges? I think the, first of all, we made a whole series of recommendations associated with uh, domestic violence reform in the wake of the Jared Remy case. And, and one of the things that I learned um, was that he had been in a bunch of different courtrooms and the court system as a, as a whole didn't talk to itself about this. Several different and this judges. Is, this has got to be part of the game plan going forward. You can't have people in front of four or five different judges each time people behaving like it's their first trip into court. We've got to be able to consolidate and aggregate that information so that judges can make informed decisions about not just bail, but about everything associated with those kinds of cases. Um, I have no problem at all, and I think it would be a good idea to have some sort of review, uh, judicial review, that takes place every 10 years or so. I mean, these are lifetime appointments. And should they have to, Mitt Romney proposed, I think, when he's running for governor, that not only should there be review every 10 years, but then they should have to be re-upped uh, by the governor's council or whomever. Well, I, should there be another vote on these people? I think the, I think the review, I, I guess what I would say is, you know, you, you can either have a process where they have to be re-upped or the review would determine whether or not they would go before the governor's council. I, I like the latter better than the former, but I have no problem with doing that. I mean, these are lifetime appointments. We want them to make good decisions. That's okay. why we set it up as a lifetime appointment. And we need but they ought to be held accountable for that decision. And we, we should be able, also. yeah, they, yeah, fine. But at the same time, 
everybody ought to know that at some point they're working for the public and the taxpayers are paying for it and they should be held accountable for the decisions they make. Let's hear from Boston Globe reporter Patricia Wen. I cover social services extensively and I have a question about the Department of Children and Families. Both of you have talked about caring about vulnerable children and the need for fixes within DCF. Neither of you, though, have talked about adding more money for the agency. A federal judge recently said that the primary problem with DCF is a budgetary shortfall more than anything else. My question is, do you think that you can fix DCF without adding more money? Charlie? Um, I actually supported the governor's proposal, which was a $30 million increase in the budget for DCF um, in this past legislative session, both for social workers, for technology, and for a variety of other pieces. But I also think there are management reforms that ought to be part of uh, what happens there. And I made a bunch of reform proposals when the, Jer um, when the Jeremiah Oliver case, that tragedy broke earlier this year. Um, I, I think in many respects, DCF has a very difficult and complicated job. I mean, in some ways, they're dealing with some of the most troubled families in the Commonwealth of Mass. Um, and the fact that the Commonwealth had an opportunity to move toward fixing this four years ago when Children's Rights filed that case, which was a very compelling case against the department, and the Attorney General and the Governor chose not to move to fix that, but instead to fight it, was a problem, and, and clearly borne out by what happened after that. And in addition to that, um, and I've said this before, you, you have a terrific record with respect to advocating for children, but to have that case in front of you and to stand silently by while the state of Massachusetts cut the department by over $40 million is a problem and showed a lack of judgment on an issue that was right in front of you um, for several years. Martha, you want to respond to that? Well, well, first of all, the case was so compelling that the judge dismissed it. Let's be clear about what happened in this case. We did represent the government in that case. That's my job, and I always do that to the best interest of the children and the families that we need to represent. Let's be clear about what's going on here. There were outside lawyers who were suing us with a one-size-fits-all solution. It wasn't the right solution for Massachusetts. I thought better use of that money to go into DCF. I do believe that we need to restructure the agency. I've had a plan for that since I've worked with that agency for 25 years. We have an agency that has a mission to protect kids, allegedly, but to keep families together. It's a mixed mandate. They don't do it right. And the pendulum swings. We leave kids in, we take them out. We need to change it. And by the way, I'm glad you're advocating for all these changes while you're running for governor, but you had an opportunity as Secretary and Undersecretary of Health and Human Services to look at caseloads, to look at technology, and one year reverted $2 million when you could have used it to hire more social workers. For the caseloads, while well, I'm working in a child abuse unit, seeing those caseloads go up. Is $30 million enough money? I mean, everybody says the big problem in this agency, with all due respect to restructuring and moving things around, is they don't have enough money, they've never had enough money. So but it's, 30 not, million, it's not just about money, Marjorie. It's but about all the, the, this judge in every study that's looked at it says the same thing. It's, it's money. They don't have enough money. But, but we could give them more money. We give them more money. The problems don't get solved because the structure of the agency doesn't work to give a mission to the social workers. So you have untrained social workers who don't get enough support, who have caseloads that are too big, or they don't have enough training. I've worked with terrific social workers. I don't mean to criticize them. But we need to change the structure of the agency. And then we need to say, with an increase in technology, Charlie would probably agree with me, we need to better communicate what the mission of that agency is and what the workers are supposed to do and hold them accountable when they don't meet those measures. You know, speaking of DCF, this is all stuff we could have been doing from 2010 forward, and instead we fought that case. Totally and, that, and the lawyer who represented that case on the other side worked in the Clinton administration. She was hardly what I would call a partisan. And finally, you know, the way you described that was you said you did what was best for Massachusetts. Yes. We should have done what was best for the children that were being served by the department. Yeah, and it was not that lawsuit. It was not settling that lawsuit for the one-size-fits-all result that the outside lawyers wanted. Uh, Charlie, I, I absolutely refused you say I've read the brief the brief is by the partisan lawyers and you've said you'd rather give a lot of money to outside lawyers to tell Massachusetts what to do I don't think that's a good solution for a manager and I don't think that's what a governor of the state should do. you know you uh, for the second time in two debates uh, Charlie Baker have praised Martha Coakley's work for children which leads me to say we have to play very briefly a snippet of two super PAC ads that when they air on television most parents tell their children they have to leave the room let's just watch a little piece of these if we can 
more than 50 children abused, neglected, lives cut short, all while under the care of the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families. Martha Coakley knew about mismanagement at DCF. How could we trust her again? Baker hiked premiums 150%, raising rates an average of $3,000 a year. And Baker eliminated nearly 2,000 jobs at his company while tripling his own salary to over $1.7 million a year. Okay, very, very, very quickly. Uh, somebody who supports you, uh, the former attorney general, says he did a great job at Harvard Pilgrim. Uh, you say she's done a great job with children. I still don't understand, briefly, why are you not asking the super PAC, Charlie Baker, and then Martha Coakley, please, I know I don't have formal power, please, Take that commercial off the air. It doesn't represent my values. Why aren't you doing that? I said at the time I didn't like the tone of the ad. I still don't like the tone so of the ad. So why don't you ask him to take it down? she and I are still having a discussion about whether they made the right decision or not. And I think the proof with regard to that is the tragedies and the problems and the broken agency at the DCF became, in many respects, at the time and through those 40 and 50 million dollar cuts in their budget. So why can't you just do it? that instead of having that ad play that makes it seem like she's a slasher or something, one of those slasher films? <laughs> Nothing? Okay, fine. Why aren't you asking that the ad about him be pulled in light of the fact that virtually everybody says, despite your criticisms, he led the saving of a Harvard Pilgrim? Well, but the facts in that ad are accurate. Premiums went up. Salary went up. That, that, is, that is the difference between those two ads. There's factual inaccuracies. I think that ad about DCF is heinous, not just about me, but suggesting that somehow I sat by while children were killed. That's, that's outrageous. But okay. this is a campaign, and I understand that. And unless, and I asked Charlie, and he wouldn't do it, unless we take the People's Pledge, there's no way to control these the ads. The first negative ad of this race, okay, was run by a super PAC, that the same week they started running that negative ad against me, they gave thousands of dollars to the Attorney General through a campaign finance loophole. I mean, to some extent, um, she doesn't have any credibility on this issue, in my opinion. Okay. I disagree, but... Let's move on. Akila Johnson from the uh, uh, Boston Globe. I spent about five days this summer reporting from Ferguson, Missouri, which is a small suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, that erupted in kind of near constant protests after an African American teenager, Michael Brown, was shot and killed. And many of the officials in the city, as well as the state, were criticized for not understanding the circumstances that contributed to the volatile situation. And so my question is, how would you, as governor, make sure that all communities, but especially communities of color, have a seat at the table so that disparities in education, housing, income, uh, as well as health care, that those gaps are closed. Charlie and Martha, we're running short on time, so could you give me one Real example quick. to address what Keel is talking about? Well, let me first say I think that we want in Massachusetts community policing, not combat policing, and that means having well-trained and diversified police departments, and I would propose getting men and women in our fire teaching uh, police uh, services by loan forgiveness or getting people involved in areas of public service that would address some of those issues, at least for policing. Charlie Baker, can you give me one example addressing Akilah's question? I'm very proud of the fact that I was endorsed by the minority, Massachusetts Minor Minority Law Enforcement Officers Association because of the time and the effort I've made getting to know the folks in those communities of color and a huge part of my economic development plan is about creating economic opportunity and improving the quality of education and public safety in those communities. And I was proud to stand with 40 or 50 leaders from those communities a week ago today in Roxbury to talk about that plan um, and to gain their support. I, the one other thing I would say quickly on this, I just happened to do a ride along um, the Friday night of, of when Ferguson was, was breaking and to the fellow named Sergeant Johnson. And I wanted him to just take me around the city for five or six hours and show me what goes on in, in, in Boston, urban Boston. And the first thing he did was he took me to Dorchester High School and to Hunt Field, where they were holding Pop Warner practice and cooking hamburgers and hot dogs and cheerleading practice. And he said, this is what goes on in this community, these communities on Friday night, which no one ever talks about. And he knew every single coach, and he knew half the parents who were there. And I think one of the things we have to do if we want to avoid situations like that is we have got to embed ourselves as human beings in these communities so that people understand that not only do we care about them, but we get where they're coming from. And they can see us, 
and that they know we're going to that if we make a commitment to them, we're going to follow through on it. Well, in okay. fairness, I've done that for about 18 years as an assistant district attorney and a district attorney with community policing, community-based justice, domestic violence victims. So I'm glad you got the ride along, Charlie. It's an important job for the governor to make sure that we have a good criminal justice system that's fair to everybody. Well, here, here's one more thing that's, that's very important in communities of color, and that's education, of course, and one of those educational factors is, is charter schools. A few months ago, I went to one of those charter school drawings where they draw the names about the kids that went in, and I was stunned because nobody was there, no parents no kids. Then I realized the reason they didn't come is because so few kids can get in. It's too depressing and upsetting to go to these things and not get called year after year after year. Um, Martha Coakley, you've been supportive, not that strongly for, for, for charter schools, even though there's 45,000 kids on the, on the list. And Charlie uh, Baker has said that denying the options of charter schools to poor kids is nothing less, this is a quote from him, than an affront to their civil rights. So how is he wrong? Well, so this is where we differ because to me it's about education. I think we've made this uh, distinction between charters or not charters. Remember, charters were the reason that we were able to see what works and what doesn't work. Extended learning time, early education, which I support that Charlie doesn't. The ways in which we're going to give every kid the best possible education. It's not about charters or not. It's about making sure we keep that promise to take those best practices from charters and see them in our district schools. We've got pilot innovation schools. We know what works. You know, before before Charlie responds to the charter school question, you mentioned pre-K. On primary night, you celebrated your universal, as you call it, pre-K plan. The universal plan has morphed into a plan where 16 or 17,000 people on the waiting list will cover hardly universal. It's roughly a sixth of the number of people who need support. Uh, what happened? Well, I still support universal pre-K. What I've said is that we are going to start with 17,000 kids at $150 million immediately to get them into places that we have. There are parents that have that ability now. I'm trying to level the playing field and make that start for the kids that we know need it. Charter schools? First of all, the Attorney General's position on early childhood ed and mine are basically the same. And I'm glad to see that now that she's in a general election, she agrees with me that we should continue to make targeted investments in expanding our participation in pre-K. On the charter school question, um, I've spent a lot of time in a lot of city schools over the course of this race. Parochial, traditional, charter. What I'm looking for is excellence. And there are many charter schools out there that do a great job, and there are 45,000 parents on a waiting list. Those parents deserve choices, okay? When I knock doors in Dorchester, when I knock doors in Mattapan, when I knock doors in Springfield, the first question that comes up when I'm talking to somebody who has school-age kids is I don't have enough choices for my kids. It is the number, and these people are not, they are desperate when they talk about this. This, I mean, for anybody who has kids, it is, it just, it kills you to hear the, to hear the, the concern in their voice. And, and there are a lot of great traditional schools out there too, filled with great teachers. And one of the things I've talked a lot about during this campaign is wanting to create relationships between folks who are actually doing a terrific job of educating kids in traditional public schools with other folks in public schools. We don't do the in-service type learning and teaching and best practices sharing that we should be doing. And as governor, I'm gonna make that happen two, three, four times a year. We've got to start doing that because there, there are stars performing in edu urban education and it. we are not leveraging that. Uh, we only have 10 minutes left. We're going to move to an issue that is huge in this country and in the state income inequality. Two measures very briefly I want to get your thoughts on. One, the minimum wage increase that went to $11 and two, question four, which would give mandatory paid sick leave to anybody who works in a place with more than 11 people. You support both those things. Yes, the minimum yes. wage Very quickly, are you not concerned about the arguments of small business that one or both of these things are going to croak a lot of them? No, and the minimum wage has been passed. I think most people supported that. It makes sense because we have families that are living from uh, week to week to pay their rent or to put food on their table. I met a couple that works at Logan Airport. She works all night cleaning planes. He works all day cleaning planes. They can barely afford to put food on their table for their 16-year-old kid. That's not right. And the corporations they work for are doing quite well, thank you. This income inequality, as we turn this economy around, has to be for everybody. And Only to give two states in the country have uh, mandatory paid sick leave, Connecticut and California. We would be the outlier if we became the third, in part because small businesses say it's a killer. Well, I think that it is absolutely a cost of doing business that they will be able to afford. This is a right for people 
who most people in this audience tonight, and I bet many of our viewers don't worry about earned sick time. If they are sick, their kid is sick, they are about to lose their jobs if they don't show up. And it's a public health issue if people are sick. And, Jim, it mostly affects women. It's disproportionately on minimum wage women who do have child care responsibilities, who don't have those vouchers yet for early education. This is just a fairness issue, and I support it. I think people overwhelmingly in Massachusetts support it. Charlie, Charlie? Baker, quickly, if we can. One, you had said early in the campaign that you uh, would consider, was your word, a sub-minimum wage for teenagers and people in training. Are you still considering it? Well, I think we should go ahead and pursue what we've, what's happened, which I supported on the minimum wage legislatively. But I also believe we should, and I would file a bill as governor and advocate, for small business tax credits for small businesses so that they have the ability to absorb the increase in the minimum wage without taking hours away from people or jobs How away about from the sub-minimum wage? Is it still on your agenda? No, your I, I agenda? prefer to just go with what we've got. Look, very quickly on question four, you've proposed the threshold not of 11 employees or more, but 50 or more. We called the NFIB, National Federation of Independent Businesses. That means 120,000 businesses, maybe within the neighborhood of a million employees, would not benefit yes. from paid sick leave. Does that not trouble you? Well, that would also be the same as the Connecticut law, by the way, which, as you point out, there are only two states in the country that have this law, and both of them, by the way, have a lot more flexibility than the Massachusetts law, as written, would, pro would propose. I support doing this. I will work with the legislature aggressively to get it done, but I worry a lot if we're all concerned about jobs and about small businesses and their ability to grow and thrive and create opportunity here, that this puts us at a significant disadvantage for small businesses. 1.2 million people who wouldn't get sick time or earn sick time under Charlie's proposal. Okay, uh, both of you. There are a lot of people, by the way, who are going to lose some of their existing flex benefits when that thing passes because they won't be able to access the flex benefits that their companies have currently put in place. Okay, okay. Both there will you, be unintended consequences. Uh, both of you have been involved in some behavior which raises some ethical questions. Uh, Charlie and Martha Coakley failed to disclose an, uh, an organization run by the co-chair of a finance committee was the prime beneficiary of a lawsuit she filed against Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So do you think the public should be worried about this, Charlie? I think the opportunity to, as the chief law enforcement officer of the Commonwealth and as the overseer of the Office of Campaign and Political Finance, I think it would have been appropriate uh, for the Attorney General to disclose that relationship, um, especially since she had uh, financial opportunities. This woman raised money for her as well and was the sole beneficiary okay. of the proposal. Yeah. Martha, you yeah, the joined premises her? in your question are false, uh, Marjorie. That statute, because I've been fighting, as everybody knows, to keep people in their homes, the big barriers, Fannie and Freddie. The only purpose in that statute was to make sure that homeowners could stay in their homes. It's not the only company that does that. It's a not-for-profit. And we disclosed everything we did that we needed to. We did exactly what we needed. Let's the issue was the closest of the of the woman that was involved. At, at, we 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 checked and we checked again and we did exactly what we did. All of her contributions were disclosed. That's what the law requires. We did everything we needed to do. Martha, let's talk about Charlie for a minute. Charlie, some critics have suggested he engaged in pay to play. He gave ten thousand dollars in New Jersey GOP. Uh, just seven months before General Catalyst, that's the investment firm where he's listed as an executive in residence, uh, received 15 million bucks from the state's pension fund. By the way, they recently sold that. Should voters be concerned about that? Charlie said he did nothing wrong legally or otherwise. Should voters be concerned about that? Yeah. Why? Because he's under investigation now for a pay-to-play scheme. Those facts, at least on their face, indicate, at least from my point of view, a, a reason to investigate. He's under investigation. He said under 33 different times he filed that he was a partner and employee of it. If that's the case, then he is in violation of the law. And if he's not, then he should disclose his contract with, the, with Catalyst Speaking as to what his re relationship is. If I can, is. the reports today, Charlie Baker, that Chris Christie and the treasurer of New Jersey, who was appointed by Chris Christie, who's a supporter of yours, the governor there, is holding up release of the investigation about this pay-to-play thing until several days after the election in Massachusetts. Would you use this opportunity now to urge Christie and his treasurer to disclose whatever their investigation is into your thing immediately prior to November 4th? Well, I certainly can't control whatever no, the state of New Jersey does. No, but would you ask them to do that? Well, they're, they're doing an investigation. I stayed as far away from it as I possibly can get, which I think is appropriate. And they'll issue their report whenever they issue it. But I will say this. You know, Martha mentioned the fact that um, 33 times I pointed out the fact that I was working with General Catalyst. I've been completely transparent about this from the beginning. I've never tried to hide anything on this. And when issues were raised about it, 
I hired the former general counsel of the Federal Election Commission and had, gave him all the documentation and said, if there's something I need to do here, tell me. So why and he wrote I a brief understand. on it. Let me finish. And, he gave me, and I wrote a brief on it. And I made that brief publicly available to anybody who wanted to see it. Why wouldn't you urge the attorney, the uh, governor of New Jersey, to disclose it immediately so the voters of Massachusetts well, the, have an objective well, perspective? Well, the New Jersey, the New Jersey Pension Board is going to make it's the Pension Board in New Jersey is going to make their decision and issue their ruling whenever they finish their study. And as far as I can tell, based on the work that was done by the former lawyer for the FEC, I've done nothing wrong. Okay. Okay, but he could resolve it by disclosing his employment contract. That would be the easiest route. Okay, Please. we're very short on time. Can I just... Uh, can I just point out that there's only one person at this table who's actually paid a campaign violation fine, and that would be the Attorney General. You want to... Yeah, absolutely. Ten seconds. Uh, I have been completely transparent when we have had errors that have been pointed out. We fixed them. It's not a fine. We reverted the money to where it should have gone. And I always have done that. That's the transparency. That's why I'm calling on you to release your employment contract. We're going to release the tension. We have three minutes left for about 60 <laughs> seconds. You want to release it, Marjorie, or should I? Yeah, let's hear from uh, uh, Ty, Burr, the, Ty Burr of the Boston Globe. He was going to ask something serious about... He's going to ask us a movie question. Well, he was going to ask you... He's got a serious question about taxes, the, the movie didn't tax credit. We didn't have time. So he's going to ask you just one quick question. Here he is. Who would play you in the movie of this campaign? And who would play your opponent? And we mean fast. Charles. Okay. Who plays you? And it's not going to be me. And who plays your opponent? Martha Copley. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Oh, come on. Okay. Reese Witherspoon. I, How's that? Sure. That okay, who plays Charlie one? Baker? Look at them looking at each other. Okay, forget that. <laughs> no, how about... No, okay, fine. Uh, we have, you want to I say got, it? I, I got Liam it. Quick. I got it. I got Liam it. Neeson. Okay. Liam Neeson. Clint Eastwood. Liam Neeson. That's Clint Eastwood. One. Plays her or you? Wall Street. <laughs> okay, fine. Very quickly here, final question. Same question we asked John Connolly and Marty Walsh before we ended the debate in the mayor's race. Most of tonight's focused on power you have if you're elected. Let's talk about power you don't have. Pick one issue that you don't have any statutory power, you can't add, increase funding for, that you would use the bully pulpit of the governor's office to advance. No statutory power, you just use your position as governor of Massachusetts to try to move the public on. What would that be, Charlie Baker? You have 30 seconds. We desperately need to create more things at night for kids to do in urban communities. And I would like to put together a big coalition of folks who are involved in all kinds of recreational and community-based and athletic activities across the Commonwealth involving urban communities and come up with things kids can do at night. Because it is a midnight basketball, right? Love Charlie. to have that too, because that's a big, big problem. How about you, uh, Martha? Well, well, you could do that. I mean, the legislature could authorize funds to do Bully that. Bully pulpit, what do you do? Yeah, I think, you know, I am most concerned about kids like young girls at Jermaine Lawrence School for Girls and others in not-for-profit settings that just don't have the resources, boys and girls, frankly, to get what they need, not just sports, but social work, mental health, help that they need. There's a lot of really troubled kids in the state that need help. Charlie Baker, Martha Coakley, thank you both. We thank really you. appreciate thank the you time tonight. That's all the time we have. I want to thank, as I said, Charlie Baker and Martha Coakley. And we want to thank our partners at the Boston Globe, and thank you all for tuning in. Good night. Jim. Thank you, Martha Coakley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.